friends. Uh, this morning we were at uh, the Chautauqua River. It runs between the border of, as the border of South Carolina and Georgia for several miles up and down this area. Feeds into a lake uh, a few miles on down the river from here. You're currently looking at a rapid called the Bull Sluice Rapid. Me and some of my friends who used to do kayaking uh, back in the around 1974 we came down here and ran this river uh, and have ran it several times over the years not in recent years but a lot of people like to come here and run this rapid and run this section of the river this is section three of the chatoga if i remember that correctly and this is in the wild and scenic rivers act so nobody can develop this nobody can spoil this pristine uh, uh, forest lands and river lands uh, right through here and this river cannot be dammed so there's good and bad about our environmental protection agency that we have but to, this morning we're looking at a rapid called bull sluice and a lot of people love to run this river and it's a beautiful river it's clear and clean and it's just a one, wonderful thing well, in the book of romans and we're in chapter eight today and we've talked quite a bit about verse one one of the last recordings and this more we'd like to pick up with uh, verse two uh, the bible says for the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus have made me free from the law of sin and death what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh god sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh uh, look at verse two right here the law of the spirit of life We've talked about six laws we find in this section of Romans. And right here is one of them that's the spirit of life. And that is with a capital S. And if you notice that uh, spirit's only been used like one other time so far in the book of Romans. And right now we find that it's used uh, several times uh, as we go from here, henceforth out. As we have talked about the basic layout of the book of Romans we find found in the first three chapters man was very much condemned then we get into chapters four and five we find uh, how that he is justified we get into chapter seven we find uh, the struggle that he has we get into chapter eight and now we begin to find one of the great assets that we have one of the great uh, gifts that God gives to the believer that is the Holy Spirit of God we read here for the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus have made me free from the law of sin and death well there's one law that overcomes another law we studied about the law of sin and death and sin when it's finished brings forth death and sin does bring forth death and that's just a law a universal law there's nobody nowhere that can escape that law the law of sin and death but right here <clears throat> we read about another law the spirit of life the spirit of life this is the holy spirit of god is being talked about uh, when he comes into you uh, which is in christ jesus he makes us free from the law of sin and death you see we're reading about one law here that overshadows and greatly over uh, rides a previous law and so this here is a much greater law the law of spirit of life because it makes us free from the law of this of sin and of death if you can see this, we're now under a greater law versus the weaker law that we were at one time under. The spirit of life is much greater. And for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, and that is true. The law could not save us. The law could not get us out of the law of sin and death. The law only kept us bound. The more we tried to keep it, the worse shape we got in. The harder we worked, the deeper we got. Uh, we could not get away from the law of sin and death by the works of, of the law and by the works of the flesh trying to do the law <clears throat> man only gets himself more frustrated and more entangled in a web that he cannot possibly get away from <clears throat> no matter how hard you work and i've said this before you never satisfy the demands of the law man is not capable of it because the bible says here the, the law was weak through the flesh. The flesh cannot fulfill the law of God. Well, let's read on right here. We have appeared, then we have uh, God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh 
and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That's the victory, is Jesus Christ. And God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And notice that it wasn't the likeness. <clears throat> if you were to look upon Jesus Christ, you'd be looking upon a man. Uh, you would see him as a man. You'd hear him speak as a man. Uh, you'd see him weep as a man. Uh, we read not about him laughing, but I think he could laugh if he wanted to. I'm sure he probably did at, time, at times. But uh, he was a man to look upon. I would say probably of average build. I doubt. I don't think he was exceedingly tall nor exceedingly short. Uh, I don't think he was exceptionally large nor exceptionally small. I think his physical frame would have been that of an average man. And then the Bible said there was no beauty in him that we should desire him. I don't think he is probably the best looking guy in the country, but uh, he was God in the flesh. God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Well, the difference between Jesus and you and I and all the rest of mankind was that he was simply made in the likeness of a man, but he was, did not have the sin factor within him, nor the sin nature that we have in us. It's born into us. But you see, Jesus was the son of God. He wasn't the son of man as after the flesh. He was born in the flesh, sent in the likeness of sin the flesh, born of the Virgin Mary into this world. But still, he was altogether God. 100% God, 100% man. But uh, he, by his own work and his own offer of the own self, uh, condemned sin in the flesh. And God sent him, notice the word right here, and for sin. God sent his own son into the world for sin. That was the reason he came, was to pay our sin debt. God sent him into this world to pay our sin debt. And he came for sin. Had the world not had sin in it, there'd have been no reason for Jesus to have came to pay the debt, because there would have not been a debt. But being that there is a great sin debt of mankind, Jesus Christ came, sent by God, into this world for that sin, and he died for our sins. And doing so, he condemned sin in the flesh because he lived a perfect life. He lived 33 years upon this earth without any sin. Ain't that amazing? But guess what he did? Then read in verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Yes, the law is satisfied because of the work of Jesus Christ that he did upon the cross. And uh, we cannot do it, we can never do it, but he did, and the Lord Jesus Christ actually did that for us uh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us and uh, you see what actually took place was jesus christ fulfilled the law he uh, he, jot, he he dotted every i he crossed every t everything the law demanded for a man to be he was and in no place did he violate the law or break the law of god not ever and so he was righteous so much to the point, so much to the fact that he was able to give us of his righteousness. Imputed righteousness, we've already read in this book, is imputed to us who believe upon him who did pay the price for our sin debt. And we, we, lock, we walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, in the next uh, few verses right here, we'll get on into this. We're going to read here about what's called the conflict of the spirit with the flesh. We've already walked, uh, talked about some of the conflict that the believer has with like a dual nature. And we do, we have that dual nature. But right here, we're going to talk about the Spirit of God. You see, Paul just does not leave any stone unturned. He looks at every subject from every angle. Of course, he's doing so under the inspiration of God. And he wasn't used just as a typewriter nor as a pencil. Uh, God allowed his personality and many things about it to come on through the writings uh, and right into the pages. And I believe the Bible is verbally inspired, uh, plenary, uh, fully inspired uh, from, from Genesis to Revelation. I think we have the complete uh, word of God that he would have for us to have. Well, let's look on right here. That's another, that's another thought. Uh, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. And that act is so true. You're after the flesh, you mind the things of the flesh. This is Sunday morning. But you know there's a lot of people this Sunday morning, they're not up thinking about God. They're not up thinking about church. They're not up getting ready to go to church. There's a lot of people this morning minding the things of the flesh. 
not far from here, there's several lakes in this part of South Carolina. And I guarantee you go to those lakes, you're gonna find those lakes full today. People in motorboats, people fishing, people skiing, uh, people uh, packing their picnic dinner for the day. They're minding the things of the flesh. Uh, it used to be on Sundays, where they're closed down now for a little while. Uh, guys are already heading off to the car races on the Lord's Day. Not at all interested in church. Uh, there's interest in the racing of the automobile. And of course, a lot of us like that. We do. We like that. But you know, uh, if we mind the things of the flesh, would not mind the things of God. But we who know the Lord is within us that we want to mind the things of the Spirit and not the things of the flesh. And I guarantee you last night, Saturday night, I guarantee you uh, the jails had a lot of visitors. I guarantee you the police officers of our uh, state, of our cities, our counties, they probably picked up a lot of guys and girls last night uh, who were breaking the law because they were minding the things of the flesh. Well, we could go on and on about things in the flesh, but then look right here. But <clears throat> they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. You see, we who know the Lord, <coughs> we who have been born again, the Holy Spirit has came within us and is within us. Uh, Christ to you, the hope of glory, He is within us. And therefore, it's a new man on the inside of us. And now the Spirit, He brings to our mind the things of the Spirit. And we should be yielded unto the Spirit of God. Of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. He makes, He gives us that wonderful desire to hear the Word of God. He gives us the wonderful desire to go to His house. He gives us the wonderful desire to live a life pleased in His sight. He gives us a desire to look into His Word. He gives us a desire to engage ourselves in many good things versus bad things. Oh, I tell you what, you get saved, you don't want to be a drunker any longer. No, you'd love to help those who are entangled with the, with the alcohol. If you could help them get out of it, you see the difference. Uh, the things of the Spirit. And the things of the Spirit is an endless list. I know people who are Christians who do all kinds of wonderful things that they've been led of the Spirit of God to do. From working in soup kitchens, to knocking on doors, inviting people to church. Uh, to traveling the world as a missionary, uh, to working in a hospital, to helping their neighbors. Uh, there's an endless list of the things of the Spirit, an endless list. And uh, not to mention prayer, not to mention reading our Bible. There is an endless list of the things of the Spirit. And so, uh, you see, uh, this could be endless. And so is it after the flesh. You make your mind up who you're going to serve. Well, look on. Paul's got a few more words to say about this uh, in the next few verses. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, carnally minded, that's the mind who doesn't think after God or walk after the Spirit. That is of the world, of the, of the race of Adam, of the mind of Adam, of the mind of the flesh. Uh, for to be carnally minded is death. Uh, people who want to engage in these things, uh, are, we would call them carnally minded. Uh, they're not concerned with the things of God nor the work of God. Uh, and everybody can be involved in the work of God from one degree to another. Well, I'm running out of my time here that I have self-allotted for these studies. But before we go, uh, you know, I'd like to share with you one or two other things this morning. In this very river <coughs> that you're looking at, and I don't know about this very spot, but almost every year for about the last 50 years, I would say, there's been somebody to drown in this river. Uh, people on uh, various types of functions, there have been people who have drowned. The first time we ran this river in our kayaks, there was a, a body in this river at some point. I, I never knew where. But somebody had drowned and the water was still holding the body in the river. And uh, there have been people every year to drown in this river. Um, now my data is not totally absolute on that, but almost every year I'll hear about somebody who's drowned in this river and has gone out to meet a holy God. Well, I don't know, but you know uh, when our day will come, I don't know when mine will come or when yours will come. But this we know, you could be ready to meet God if you'd 
confess yourself to be a sinner and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you could be ready to meet God. Should your day come today and you're not ready to meet Him, why not right now ask the Lord to come into your heart and to save your soul from a devil's hell from which surely you're heading and that which surely you deserve, the same as myself at one time was. May God bless you and help you.